Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon, and I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University, and welcome to Vlog 272. You're not as good as you think you are. A discussion. This vlog comes via request from a remarkable student who, like many of the students in this Rescue Yourself, Rescue Ourselves series, wish to remain anonymous. But can I send all my love and hopes to this remarkable student. She sent me an email and she was absolutely distraught and so we had a, a Skype conversation and she was crying, absolutely distraught and considering whether or not she should actually leave a PhD program because her supervisor had said the immortal phrase to her, you're not as good as you think you are and she didn't know really what that meant or what she could do with that statement going forward in her research life. So I asked her, how about I do a vlog on this? And I take that phrase, look at the research, and explore what that phrase means, but also configure some strategies, some options, and some tools for students, for all of us, to use when that dreadful phrase emerges in our life. You're not as good as you think you are. And colleagues, look, in tough times like now, it's very common that threatened people hit out, they spit out, they label, they ridicule, they judge. So most importantly today, I want to take this phrase, I want to understand it, but I want to give you some tools some tools that you can use in real time when that phrase is used at you. And you can go, right, that's been said. Now I'm going to give you 10 things you can do immediately to handle that situation, but also to help you manage it in the medium and long term. So to start this vlog, I wanted to commence with two stories that I also shared with the wonderful student that inspired our gig today. And these are the two occasions in my academic life where someone has used that phrase, you know, as good as you think you are, at me. So I'm sharing these stories. They're horrendously fabulous, as m most of the stories involving that phrase are. But I'm sharing it so that you can see that you can rescue yourself and we can rescue ourselves from situations where people say the unsayable. What do you do? This is what you do. So, yes, the first time <laughs> this phrase was used at me, and that's the right word when it was used at me, was when I was a research higher degree student. Yes, I was you. I was enrolled in a research master's degree. Very, very young woman. Posh university, terribly posh university, and completely absent supervision. And when I say completely absent supervision, the supervisors missed two years of meetings. In other words, they never actually came to a meeting during the entire candidature. But I believed passionately in this project. It was a wonderful project, wonderful research area, and wow, it was ahead of its time. It was radically interdisciplinary. In fact, it was post-disciplinary before that phrase was really used. And look, I was about to submit this thesis before the due date, when a senior lecturer at this posh university, and he seemed incredibly old, can I say, he's probably the age I am now, but the senior lecturer at this posh university said, oh, look, I'd like to read that thesis. And, you know, I thought, a bit odd, but I let him read it. Now, this was two weeks before I was submitting this master's degree, and this male senior lecturer read it, and then asked me to sit down, and I remember this viscerally. He asked me to, it was in the afternoon, and he asked me to come into his office, close the door, and he sat down, and it was, you know, a hot Perth afternoon, and he said it was absolutely shocking, the thesis was shocking, and if I submitted it, I would fail. And he also then said the immortal line, now Tara, you're not as good as you think you are. I was 22 years old, a very young 22 years of age from a working class family, working class friends. I was a foreigner in this 
posh university. I'd survived it, I'd done well, but I never really felt that I belonged there. But somehow, and even looking back on it all these decades later, somehow that 22-year-old girl believed in that research enough and believed in herself enough where this has come from, I've got no idea, to, to actually say, no, he's wrong. And two weeks later, I submitted that thesis and I did not implement one single correction that that gentleman suggested. It went in as I wanted it to go in. And what happened? Well, let me tell you the end of the tale. Two of the greatest scholars in my disciplines were the examiners of that thesis, and they still are the greatest names, I would argue, in my field. And they examined it, and their reports were very similar. Both of them said, how has this been allowed to be submitted as a master's degree? It's clearly a PhD, and of course that's what happens when you don't have supervisors, because no one says to you, oh, you should upgrade, so you're enrolled in the master's, so you finish it. So why was she enrolled in a master's degree? Secondly, they stated it was the greatest research project they'd ever read from a student. And thirdly, both of them granted it a research master's with distinction, which in this posh university was absolutely unheard of. So that's story one. You're not as good as you think you are. Really? And I saw that bloke uh, about a year later when I'd moved universities uh, to do my PhD and he congratulated me and he said to me, quote, I'm amazed I got it so wrong. End of quote. Indeed. Indeed. Now that's story one. Now let me tell you about story two, where someone said to me, you're not as good as you think you are. And we're going way forward in time here, not just a few years, we're going forward decades to January 2016. And I'm at the antithetical point of a higher degree student. I'm a full professor and I'm a head of school. And in this regional university, which I loved with a passion, I love the students, I love my colleagues, I love the city, I love the project of regional education. But this remarkable place that could have been was being destroyed by very, very poor university leadership that didn't understand the nature of the regional experience, being real in a regional environment and understanding what that means. And this university was going downhill pretty well, almost completely because of bad leadership. And my beloved late husband, Steve Redhead, was treated like uh, a tub of yogurt uh, past its use by date by nobody less than the Vice Chancellor. So we're really doing well here. And look, we decided we love this place. We've got a lot of friends here. But you know what? We're probably on our way. And so we both applied for a lot of jobs, got quite a lot of them, as we always do. So you just try and make sure you've got a proper choice. But I love this place so much that I thought, let me just be sure that we have to move. And so a, a sub-dean role in the faculty where I was a head of school was advertised. And just to make sure, I applied for it. And there was a new dean in town. And this dean, to quote the who, here is the new boss, same as the old boss. And yes, you've guessed it, and let's all say it together as a family, this horror movie of a dean was a woman. So I'd agreed before Christmas, indeed on Christmas Eve, that I would accept what is my current job, what is my Dean role, and that was a great decision and it's one of the happiest times of my life. It was a wonderful Christmas, it's been a wonderful job and a wonderful experience. But Steve and I kept that Christmas Eve decision a secret until we were ready to resign, got the house in order, literally and metaphorically, so we were able to move our life once more. But as this clock was ticking on, this Dean, uh, in response to my last test when I applied for this sub-Dean role, said she wanted to have a, a feedback meeting with me, that she hadn't given me the role and she really wanted to have a meeting to discuss it. So she made an appointment with me at 9am about the third week of January. Now, because this woman has some form in name calling and abuse, I always made sure my personal assistant was on the call. And I would always tell the Dean, my personal assistant is here to take good notes so I can follow your instructions. And so the wonderful Louise 
was in on the call as well and only Steve and Louise knew that I'd accepted this role as Dean. So 9am the meeting happens, uh, I introduce Louise, we take the call and Louise starts to take notes. And this Dean explained to me in great detail, can I say, uh, what was wrong, what a terrible person I was, what a terrible academic I was, and she sort of catalogued, she made sure that she was cataloguing exactly how poor I was. And she explained to me that academic managers shouldn't have the number of qualifications I have. She described it as ridiculous. She stated that it wasn't appropriate for an academic manager, great phrase, to be research active. It's not appropriate for an academic manager to teach and supervise students. And my personal favorite, I think, was it's not appropriate for an academic manager to write journalism, particularly, quote, foreign journalism. Uh, and she was particularly dismissive of me writing for the Times Higher Education, which she described as foreign journalism. Love me a bit of xenophobia in my leadership. Great stuff. So she explained I simply was not good enough for this sub-dean role and that I should give up because I was pretty incompetent. And here comes the phrase, Tara, you're not as good as you think you are. And here's the kicker, <laughs> here's the kicker. She said, quote, and you'll never be dean, end of quote. Now, for those of you that have come in late, just a reminder, I was already appointed as dean when I took that call. Okay, so I didn't speak during this telephone call, and we'll talk about shortly the value of silence in managing this particular phrase. So she delivered this diatribe in an absolute gush. She got herself angrier and angrier and angrier, and she was full on shouting at the end. And by the end, Paul Louise was <laughs> taking us, and, and by the end, she, you know, in a full yell, she said, What have you got to say for yourself? And I simply replied, thank you very much for your feedback. I wish you a good day. Put the phone down and needless to say, Louise and I did laugh a fair amount. And then we got on with the work of our day. Now, as you can see, the phrase, you're not as good as you think you are, is really problematic, but it is a phrase you should listen to because there are some stories and some narratives behind it that you need to hear. It's a proxy for a series of behaviours. So let me now present quickly for you the 10 strategies that I recommend when that phrase is used at you. And look, because it is such a hurtful statement, I mean, it's just simply spoken to hurt you. Because it's such a hurtful statement, I wanted to make sure today that the advice I was giving you could be used quickly. So just remember a few of these strategies so when a dreadful thing happens to you, you've got something to fight with in real time. So don't be frozen by this dreadful phrase. Understand it, contextualize it, and render it meaningful in your research career. And can I say, the strategies I'm about to give you work not only with this phrase, you're not as good as you think you are, but whenever anybody in power, or not in power, says the unsayable to you, something that's just purely cruel, these strategies will work for you. So let's do this. Come on, let's do this. Number one, number one strategy, the obvious one, laugh. Laugh. The most powerful response to the phrase, you're not as good as you think you are, is laughter. And laughter is so powerful because it rebukes, it ridicules, it frightens, but it also creates a community. It recalibrates power relationships, even temporarily. Now, laughter makes trouble, and laughter creates instability. And that's why laughter is feared, by the way, because when people laugh together, they share something. The bullies, the narcissists, the dreadful people inside our universities and indeed in every single workplace need to separate people to maintain control. But laughter is rebellion because when we share laughter, we share a literacy and we share a context. Now, Mikhail Bakhtin 
did some fantastic research on this mode of liberation, as he described it, through his history of the carnival. And this temporary liberation flipped hierarchies and particularly focused its laughter on religious morality. Now, in secular times, think about how much we take terribly seriously that really we shouldn't, that we should respond to with laughter. Bachtin showed that the carnival in the Middle Ages attacked the church and attacked the state and was seen to be so dangerous that it was banned in the 17th century. So as you can see, laughter is embodied critique and it occupies space. And laughter can't be patrolled by ridiculing phrases like, what are you laughing at? Or my personal favorite, it's just not that funny. Yeah, it is. It is really that funny. So we need to also acknowledge here the profound heritage of Helene Sassou to this conversation. Her essay, The Laugh of the Medusa, changed my life. It was originally published in 1976. But if you ever need any inspiration, any juice, to remind you about the power of writing and why writing matters, then I draw you to this remarkable essay. And I'll just give you a taste of it. Quote, women must write through their bodies. You only have to look at the Medusa straight on to see her. And she's not deadly. She's beautiful. And she's laughing. So the lesson from Sisu is occupy space and use laughter. And one way to make trouble is to call out injustice through that laughter. Two, review the profile of your tormentor. This is my f personal favorite strategy. So if laughter does make you uncomfortable, and that's probably the point of it, another great strategy after this phrase has been used at you is to review the profile of your tormentor. So if they're attacking you on your supposed delusions about your ability, open up Google Scholar and have a bit of a look at them. <laughs> now, you invariably will be surprised because this dreadful phrase, you're not as good as you think you are, is used by someone who has lost control. More precisely, though, someone who's lost control over you. So, you're not as good as you think you are, as a phrase, has nothing to do with you at all. At all and everything to do with the person that is using it. They're using it for a reason. So have a look at their profile. Have a look at their books, their book chapters, their articles, and see how often they are the first author of an article or the last author of an article. More precisely, see how often they are in what I describe as the twilight zone of authorship. So author three, four, five, or six of eight, or 10, or 15, or 20. So these positions, so you're author four of six, these positions before the research code of conduct were described reasonably cruelly as the freeloading postdoc authorship position. And I'd like to apologize to all the postdocs out there, okay? This is not about you. I know invariably postdocs are doing some hard yakka here. Invariably, the freeloading postdoc position is occupied by very senior professors. Bless. So you'll be amazed how often the nastiest of people have spent a lot of their research life as author four of six. And of course, in Google listings, it doesn't matter what authorship ranking you're in because all the citations come to your profile. So you know what? Let's make a pledge today, all of us, that we'll be the first author. We'll be the last author. Maybe we'll even be the sole author. Be the star of our own lives. And not only claim citations, but make sure that you have earned 
those citations. Be proud of the work that you do and know authentically that you've earned those citations and you've never pushed any other human down to get them. Three, here we go, use silence. Okay, now laughter works really well. A sojourn into Google Scholar works really well, but so does silence. And can I say, I use this a lot. The reason being that our culture is made incredibly uncomfortable by silence. So when some random comes out with the phrase, you're not as good as you think you are, they're using that phrase because they want to fight. They want to provoke you. They want to hurt you so that you respond aggressively. So therefore, a truly stunning response, and I want you to always remember this, is silence. Wow. And hold the silence because silence makes people really, really uncomfortable. So what I always try and do too, I don't just use silence, I try and sort of stare at people with just a little bit of Jack Nicholson, you know, sort of Jack in the 70s. So you use silence with the weird stare. And this works tremendously in meetings, can I say. So have the courage to sit in the discomfort of silence and then walk away. Four, here we go. Use it as motivation. Now, I love it when people have a go at me. I really love it. Bring it. Bring it. Come on, bring it. Because they're often pretty posh and they can't understand how somebody with an accent like me has been able to sort of have any success in life at all. Now, as you can see by the two stories that started this vlog today, I've used this dreadful phrase to really punch me forward in my life. I've used it as motivation and inspiration. So I've used other people's bitterness and nastiness as fuel in the car of my life. Now, if you can park the emotion, and that's hard to do, but if you can park the emotion and don't succumb to hurt or shame or embarrassment and use some of the strategies we've talked about, the tools we've talked about today in real time, then after the storm has passed, after this dreadful emotional moment has passed, remember this event. Remember this person and use it. Use that memory every day when you feel like sleeping in, when you feel like, oh, I can't really be bothered, I might finish early, or you're not committing strongly to that research project. Use it. Prove them wrong. Prove them wrong. Five, know that this phrase is not based in reality or truth. Now, you have the right to be yourself. You don't have to be like another researcher to be successful. You can sit in yourself and be comfortable with that. You don't have to be anybody else. And know that you're doing something incredibly courageous. You are enrolled in a PhD. Wow! Be proud of that. You are doing something fantastic. And you know what? At this point, you might not be the best researcher in the world because you are learning and the learning is great. Now, your career won't be fully realized yet, but you're moving forward and make sure that every single week, hi to Jesse, Jesse, this includes you. Every single week, I want you to look at your CV and add something to your CV every week if you can and be proud of your development. And remember, focus on development. Focus on how much you've already achieved. Don't allow anyone, anyone, including your supervisor or advisor, to undermine your growth, undermine your development, undermine the achievements you've already gained. If it helps, you are exactly where you need to be now. You are where you need to be. 
Six, recognize that your emotional response to this statement is absolutely understandable. Now, the point of life, besides breathing and Netflix, is to be heard, is to be understood. So when supervisors or peers or your bosses say the unsayable to you, we feel unseen and we feel unheard. I really get that because, you know, you work hard. And a lot of our academic culture is about when you work hard, you are acknowledged in some form. Now, Australian culture, research culture, university culture, is absolutely out of control at the moment. Um, you get an award for opening an envelope in Australian universities at the moment. Someone opens an envelope, woo, yeah, come on, give that person a prize, okay? So the challenge of a culture like this at the moment is if you're not being noticed, if you're not being appreciated, if you're not getting a prize for opening an envelope, then you start to worry about whether or not you belong in a doctoral program. You know, maybe a PhD is not for you. And then self-doubt starts to emerge. Now, so many issues, I think, emerge with PhD students when they don't feel appreciated or understood. So I really get this. And as we've talked about, we need to show kindness to your supervisors, to your advisors, because Many of your supervisors are one email away from being restructured out of the organisation. Universities are that unstable at the moment. The economy is chaotic. The economy is disordered. So don't read that lack of excitement or that lack of passion about your project. Don't necessarily read that as a critique, okay? And maybe the meta point we all have to grasp here is wanting to be noticed wanting to be appreciated, wanting a prize for opening an envelope, <laughs> those aspirations present their own issues. As the great philosophers split ends have confirmed, the great Plato of pop, Tim Finn, wrote in a lyric, ambition has cost me friends and time. End of quote. And look, ambition always presents a bill. So learn in difficult times to develop intrinsic motivation, intrinsic rewards. And that means when some hashtag random comes along and use the phrase, you're not as good as you think you are, it doesn't bother you too much because you've got the resources that you have within you so that you don't require the validation of others to give your life, to give your research meaning. Now, it's not a bad idea, and I've started to do this myself during this Rescue Ourselves series, to take 20 minutes every Friday afternoon and have a cycle of self-reflection on the week. What went well this week? Most importantly, what did we learn this week? What, did, what, did I, what do I know how to do today that I didn't know how to do on Monday? And so I have that cycle of reflection. And that means because of the self-validation cycle, you're not as reliant on what other people think of you to feel valued and appreciated. Seven, make sure you've got trusted friends around you. Now, when you're in a hostile or a toxic environment, and can I say a toxic environment, workplace or, and or a university, can be created by one person. So a workplace can be magnificent, one new person is hired who's toxic, and it destroys the entire workplace. So we're all really one person away from a toxic workplace. But in these sort of environments, make sure you've got trusted people around you. And this friendship group, these peers, are very precious because they've also got to be honest with you. They've got to help you provide, if you will, an honest mirror on your life. Now, some of these great friendships, hello Jackie, some of these great friendships survive over decades. And these great friends need to be supportive, but they also need to be accurate. They need to help you in tough times. So you need people who will be honest with you about your teaching, about your research, and about your career. And in this wider context, these matrix of very special relationships 
means that you'll have the resources you require when a nasty person does terrible things to you. You'll at least have a matrix of friends around you to provide that honest mirror so you're not as reliant on what some random says about you. Eight. Yep. Recognize that some situations require you to be John Wayne and ride out into the sunset. If the person is using the phrase, you're not as good as you think you are, and they're not seven Chardonnays to the wind, or just having gone through a truly dreadful personal tragedy, then to be frank with you, that phrase is never excusable. They may apologize for it later, that phrase should never be used to a human, okay? But it is a sign of something important that you have to notice, okay? This, if this is used to you as a PhD student, you're not as good as you think you are, that is the sign you need to finish that thesis really, really quickly, and or you need to add another supervisor to your panel, and or you need to notify the Dean of Graduate Research so that I can be aware of the situation, okay? And if this is a boss, if this happens to you in a workplace, then don't panic, but you do need to start to make preparations to leave. So it doesn't mean you quit that day, but it does mean, you know what, the clock is ticking, and I will now start applying for other jobs to get myself out of this situation. So in many ways, treat this dreadful statement as a gift, because it is a trigger for a moment of change in your life. Nine, use this statement to take stock of who you are, what you do, and why it matters. This statement can knock you for many of the reasons that we've talked about. But just like, you know, the phrase, you're not as good as you think you are, is a sign to finish the thesis up quickly or get another job pretty quickly, it's also an opportunity for you to create a framework of reflection. So what is happening in doctoral culture at the moment? Am I feeling vulnerable? And what resources am I going to need to feel safe and secure and productive and continue on my developmental journey? I always remember the amazing statement from Marianne Williamson that the great Nelson Mandela used in his inauguration. And of course, people always assumed it was Nelson Mandela that said it, but it was actually Marianne Williamson. I've got this phrase uh, upstairs in my office, quote, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light not our darkness that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? End of quote. So think about the resources you need to be brilliant, talented, gorgeous, <laughs> Fabulous. And I should also cite the last bit of the Williamson statement, quote, as we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. End of quote. So if you're being attacked, ridiculed and undermined and you enact some of the strategies we're talking about today, you will make it better for the people who follow you. 10. <laughs> Just occasionally summon your inner drag queen. Now, I do this very rarely. Well, to be honest, I have a lot of inner drag queen look at my eyeliner, but I very rarely use this strategy. But when I do use this strategy, it is truly tremendous and you feel great. And look, I've, I've nicked this strategy off my late husband, Steve Redhead, who used to use it a lot, okay? And there's something sort of quite fabulous about a six foot two, 15 stone, posh, uh, lawyer trained English academic professor using his inner drag queen. And the reason this happened is people use this phrase a lot 
against Steve. I mean, twice in my life, but Steve got, you're not as good as you think you are all the time. <laughs> Right, so wow, okay. And he would always respond with the most magnificent drag queen response. So someone would say, you're not as good as you think you are. And he would pause and he'd say, I'm sorry, who are you? Magnificent. And he would deliver it completely deadpan with this posh Northern English accent. You know, you're not as good as you think you are. I'm sorry, who are you? And look, this works so well in Australia as a strategy, can I say? Because our universities are populated by all these Ozymandiases, I think I can use it in the plural. You know, these people that build these monuments in the sand about how fabulous they are, and then you go look at those monuments and there's actually nothing there. So every now and again, when a completely arrogant, self-absorbed, underperforming monster gets in your path and uses a phrase like this, then just lift, up, lift an eyebrow, look a bit confused and state, I'm sorry, who are you? And then of course, like RuPaul, you can sashay away. Now today, I hope we've had some fun in this vlog because it's a very serious, very terrible phrase that we've talked about today, but I wanted to provide some strategies for you so that you can regain control at least of yourself and your emotions when these unsayable, dreadful phrases are said at you. And look, we all control very, very little in our lives, but we can control our response to the bad behavior of others. And when we regain control, we make it better and easier for the colleagues that follow us. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.